Welcome to We Choose to Thrive. This is our interview series with women who have decided to rise above the abuse, no matter what kind of abuse it was, of their past, and to live rich, full lives. We hope you will enjoy our interview series. Marissa Cohen, I am so delighted to have you here for the We Choose to Thrive book and video series. What what inspired you to be a part of our, our program? Well, as a survivor, um, I wanted to take all the negative things that had happened to me in my life and turn it into a positive. I, I chose to thrive, and, and I wanted to use those experiences to help other people who, are, who have also gone through those experiences. That's beautiful. And I think in our, in our discussions before we have this interview, you were mentioning that, it, that you felt like it was important that we not stay quiet. Right. I think, I'm sorry, one of the most important things, one of the most important things I think we can do as survivors is to speak out about it. There's a larger number of survivors than anybody really knows because the statistics show that only about 5% of them are reported. And I know I never reported, so I'm part of the 95%. But I think that by speaking out and, and being able to tell our stories and know that we're supported by millions of other people who have also experienced similar things, it, it's empowering. It's empowering to know that you're not alone. It's empowering to know that you have a network of people behind you who have also dealt with it, who are willing to also help you. And by speaking about it, you're showing people that there is strength in it and there is strength in numbers. Very good. Give everybody, give our listeners um, just a little bit of a glimpse of what happened to you. Sure. So when I was 19, um, my first boyfriend in college was physically, emotionally, sexually, and psychologically abusive to me. And um, I remember the actually the exact date, but um, one night we were at his house and I was supposed to leave uh, to go home so I wouldn't miss my curfew. And he wanted to stay and cuddle and he said if you wanted to, like if if I want to cuddle uh, for the last 15 minutes I'm there then we have to cuddle naked which wasn't an unusual thing for us and so for for me who had never had sex and never had any experience with it that was incredibly intimate for me um, and then the next thing I knew he had rolled me on my back and put my hands up and he was raping me um, I was in total shock. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. Uh, I don't even know how long it, it lasted. Um, but I know that when he was done, he rolled over and laid on his back, and he was incredibly satisfied with his stomach, you know, heavy breathing, like, oh, my God, I worked so hard. I did such an amazing job. And I was laying there still in shock, frozen. I couldn't even process what had just happened. I didn't realize that you can get raped by a boyfriend. I thought rape was some random guy jumps out of the woods, rapes you, and then, he, and then leaves. So for me, being sexually abused by a boyfriend uh, who I thought I loved was really traumatic. And it was a huge violation of my, of my personal space and my privacy, but I couldn't, I couldn't express that because I didn't think that what happened was wrong. I thought I was just supposed to have sex with him. I thought that was just part of the deal. Uh, so I ended up rolling over and crying <laughs> Or missing my curfew and calling my mom in hysterics that I was late and I was so sorry and I just couldn't drive. And she was like, it's fine, just stay over there, not a big deal. I went home in the morning and she pretty much validated that, you know, well, sex is a beautiful thing and you're supposed to have sex with your boyfriend. Like, if you love them, you're supposed to. I didn't tell her I didn't want to or I didn't want to, but she was just trying to make me feel better. It's okay, I have a dog too, and she's about to whimper to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> I can't control when they decide to just... <laughs> okay. So, when... You know, the, this is something that I'm sure many other girls will relate to. And one of the reasons that we are speaking up, and, you know, abuse is abuse, no matter what kind of abuse it is. And it can come from many different sources. And there's no comparing one for the other. But the fact is, is that we're sticking up mainly because, well, I was 60 years old before I spoke up. And I didn't realize that there were so many others that had 
experienced the same thing. I kept it deep within me, and I think there's many that have gone to their grave never speaking up, but it doesn't do well. It doesn't mean good things for their health. It doesn't be, mean good things for their spirit. And to, to just look at you and see a young woman that is willing to speak up and take action and do this and spread the message is wonderful because that will help you not have to go through all the years that many of us have had to go through where we keep it locked up in our souls. You know? So what would you say to someone who is recognizing that they are in an abusive situation and are just beginning to consider taking the steps that they need to, to not only to get out of the bad situation, but to begin healing and to begin to really thrive. What would you say to them? So that's like a three part question. Mm -hmm. My first response would be make sure you're safe. Um, don't just leave and run away and ne think about never coming back because what's going to end up or what could end up happening is you get yourself in a predicament where you have to go back and then it could be worse. Or maybe if you aren't, you know, planning ahead or m making sure that all of your bases are covered, you know, you could, you could potentially be putting yourself in a more unsafe position. Now, I'm definitely not recommending people stay. That is not what I want. I want everybody who's in an abusive relationship or an abusive situation to get out. And I want them to go far and be prepared and be safe but I also want them to have a safety plan because if they don't have a plan, they could be causing more harm and end up just having to go back and it could be worse for them or they could you know, end up in an even worse situation. So just prepare yourself, reach out to every and any resource available, find everything you need to do, get advice from people, talk to people because that's what's gonna keep you safe and that's what's gonna keep you alive. Um, as far as the healing process goes, I'm a huge advocate for talking about it. Um, I'm also a huge advocate for domestic violence and sexual assault. Uh, that's what I do. But I think that talking about it and, and feeling comfortable, finding somebody you're comfortable with talking about it that you know will validate you and will make you feel comfortable and won't question you, you know, like a best friend or somebody you don't know on online in a – a forum or on Facebook in one of the survivor groups. There's hundreds of them. Those people are the most supportive because they've all gone through it and they have that sense of empathy that maybe people who haven't gone through it don't quite understand. Right. Very good. Yeah. One thing about today's world is that there is a lot more support than there ever was before. And, be and years ago, it was something that wasn't spoken about. It wasn't, we didn't talk about it. Yeah. Absolutely. So what other resources, what resources did you tap into when you began your healing journey? So truthfully, I never reported it, and I didn't even acknowledge it until six months later. I actually, no, I didn't speak about it um, until one random day. I was driving with my best friend. I was driving. We were jamming out to Taylor Swift and eating candy, and all of a sudden she said something like, can we stop and get ice cream? If you love me, you'll do it. And for some reason, even though he never said that to me, that triggered me. And I was so triggered, I started hyperventilating, going into a full panic attack, which I'd never had. And she needed to grab the wheel and pull us over to the shoulder because I was going to crash into something. I couldn't control my body. And that's when she was like, what the heck just happened to you? Like, what, what, where did that come from? And I told her, I think Dave did something that I didn't want him to do. I don't think I wanted this to happen and I've been trying to fight to try and figure out why I feel so empty and, and out of control and vulnerable all the time. And, and I really just dug deep and explained everything to her. And I felt so liberated after that. I just didn't, I didn't talk about it again for a while, but I knew that I could because I was validated. Very good. So um, you're 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 in a project right now that that you've been telling me about. Could you tell our listeners about it? Sure. So I own a nonprofit called Within Your Reach. We help um, 
we advocate for sexual assault and domestic violence survivors in various different ways. Um, we conduct trainings uh, for advocates to standardize the quality of care that survivors get in the hospitals and through police departments. We um, do education in the community. We go to faith-based community centers and, I'm sorry, faith-based organizations and community centers and youth groups and things like that and just explain the dangers of sexual assault and domestic violence, the resources available. Um, but one of the projects I'm working on is through my nonprofit and collaborating with other nonprofits with the same mission or similar missions around the country, it's called hashtag I'm a statistic. Because the idea of being a part of a statistic typically has a negative connotation. People think, oh, I'm just a statistic. I'm just a cog in the machine. But truthfully, there's so much power in numbers that nobody has tapped into yet. If 1.5 million girls alone are, are raped in colleges every year and none of those girls speak up, that's 1.5 million people that feel like they're alone. But that's also 1.5 million people. That's a huge statistic. And all of those people, if they band together, outnumber the number of people that are actually doing the abusing and the assaulting and the raping. And so if all of those people find that they're not alone and become a part of that statistic and, and feel empowered by being a part of that statistic, I feel like we might be able to end the stigma and also end the silence. Those are key, really key factors and it's beautiful that you're doing it. It, it at a young age and yet you have the the vision and the will to, to, to do something like that. Because the statistics, what is it? What they figure is one in three women and one in five men have gone through some kind of abusive situation. And and yet there's no way to validate it or, or concrete it because so many of us have stayed silent. So to be a statistic to, to change the tide and to create awareness is incredibly valuable and very, very important. So my hat's off to you for, for being willing to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you for a delightful interview, and we'll put links to your I am a statistic thing here in the video, and um, just really applaud what you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this We Choose to Thrive interview. If you are currently in an abusive situation, please seek help immediately. Our purpose in creating this book and video series is to form a sisterhood of support. Know that abuse is abuse no matter what kind it is. The stories in this We Choose to Thrive series are as many and varied as the people in it. If this resonates with you, we welcome you and invite you to join us. If you know someone who would benefit from hearing this interview, please feel free to share.